Dio. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure and honor. And have a good meal, everybody. I try to keep you awake during your meal. So why should we let our patients breathe? I think there are two relevant questions here to address. What are the eff adverse effects of not breathing? What are the adverse effects of controlled mechanical ventilation? And the second question I'd like to address, is it indeed safe to use partially supported modes or to let our most sickest, sickest patients breathe at all? Using controlled ventilator modes, so taking the patient's respiratory muscles out of the loops does have adverse effects, in particular on the respiratory muscles. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But when you're breathing, when you're using the diaphragm, you may recruit the lung, which improves oxygenation. So if you're not using the diaphragm, it might, under certain conditions, promote lung collapse and such deoxygenation, shunting. Controlled mechanical ventilation might impair hemodynamics. When we breathe, intrathoracic pressure goes down, which improves, at least in certain patients, venous return. And nice data by Puttinson in the 90s have demonstrated that under pressure support ventilation, cardiac output is higher compared to pressure control under similar pressures. And of course, with controlled mechanical ventilation, we, we require higher levels of sedation. I'm sure you've seen this picture a million times. I mean, it's a landmark study by Levine, published in New England Journal of Medicine in 28, and he demonstrated that in brain-dead patients, only a few days of controlled mechanical ventilation is associated with atrophy of the diaphragm muscle. I'll come back to that later. This more recent and very important study published by Golliger in the Blue Journal in 2015, what he did right here is measure thickness of the diaphragm in ventilated ICU patients. And what he actually saw, so right here, it shows the change in thickness from ICU admission and the number of days, that in like 10% of the patients, thickness of the diaphragm increased. In 45% of the patients, there was no change in thickness of the diaphragm. And in 45% of the patients, thickness of the diaphragm decreased. And there are two important things here. First, the decrease in thickness of the diaphragm, at least in this study, happened within the first three to four days of controlled mechanical ventilation. And also, those patients that lost diaphragm thickness were those patients with the highest level of support, which also supports a role for disuse in developing weakness of the respiratory muscles. This study from Chabet in France looked at pressure generating capacity of the diaphragm in ICU patients. And after only three to four days of mainly controlled mechanical ventilation, pressure generating capacity of the diaphragm was reduced by 25%. It's only a small study, but it's still, I still think it's important data. So yes, there are adverse events of controlled mechanical ventilation of not using the respiratory muscles. But the second very important question is, is it safe to use partially supported modes in our sickest patients, in this patient with ARDS? Is this still compatible with lung protective mechanical ventilation? So this is a study we published like two years ago in anesthesiology, where patients were ventilated in three modes for supported ventilation, assist pressure control, pressure support, and NAVA. And if you go from left to right, so from this mode to right here, the patients had more freedom to control the ventilator. So these were patients with ARDS, PF ratio 140, so moderate ARDS, PEEP of 14, and inspiratory support of around 12 centimeters of water. So first look at the diaphragm effort. So assist pressure control, pressure support, and NAVA. No significant difference between the three groups actually. 
And in general, tidal volume was around 6 ml per kilogram. Only this one patient seemed to be a little bit of a problem, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Perhaps tidal volume is not the most important, as you know. It's the transpulmonary pressure, which is probably the most important. So let's look at the transpulmonary pressure. All these patients were equipped with gastric esophageal balloons, so we were able to measure transpulmonary uh, pressures. And as you can see, although there was a significant difference in favor of NAVA, I think from a clinical perspective, clinical point of view, there's not really a difference. And all they are more or less in the range of safe, of lung protective mechanical ventilation. But again, if we look at this specific patient, going back to his data, this was a patient with a very low pH and probably therefore a very high respiratory drive. And that might be a problem. This is another example of a patient with a high respiratory drive. Patient more or less recovering from ARDS. At this time, PF ratio of 135, pH of 746, and his tidal volume, 6 ml per kilogram, should be 420. But as you can see right here, despite low level of support, five of pressure support, tidal volumes were between 700 and 800 ml. Way too high, I guess. And is that a problem? Why is that a problem, such a high respiratory drive? I think that's nicely demonstrated by this fantastic study from Toronto by Yoshida. And he looked at Pendeluft. And Pendeluft is actually more or less defined as the movement of gas without a change in tidal volume. It tells you something about diaphragm-lung interaction, right? I'm going to show you an example from this study. So this is a patient after cabbage, severe hypoxemia, pH 726, so probably high respiratory drive, PF ratio 97, and they used electrical impedance tomography to study changes in tidal volume in certain, right here, in certain, certain regions of interest. So zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. And as you can see here, initially the patient was on controlled mechanical ventilation and neuromuscular blockers. So at the start of inspiration, of course, airway pressure goes up, there's inspiratory flow, and there is an increase in volume in zone one, increase in volume in zone two, zone three, and zone four. So a rather homogeneous distribution of the tidal volume. But now, if this same patient is switched to a supported mode, Look what happens here. At the start of inspiration, even before there is triggering of the ventilator, the amount of air in zone one, in the most ventral part of the lung, actually decreases. While at the same time, it increases in zone four. And this is Pendeluf. So before the patient triggers the ventilator, air moves from zone one to zone four. And only during the second phase of inspiration, the amount of air decreases in zone four and moves to zone one. So this very nicely demonstrates the Pendeluf phenomenon. And it's shown right here in this video. So this is during controlled mechanical, vent mechanical ventilation, a rather homogeneous distribution of the tidal volume. While well, the patient is in assisted ventilation, you can see there's an initial increase in volume in the more dorsal parts of the lung. And they calculated by complex physiology that this would result, this pendle loop would result in a stress which is about the same as when the patient would be ventilated with 15 ml per kilogram. Then, and that's interesting as well, they started to administer uh, uh, sucks. Oh, excuse me. Right here. So a neuromuscular blocker. Look at the swing in esophageal pressure and, I shouldn't touch this, and the pendeluft volume. As the neuromuscular blocker moves in, the swings in esophageal pressure decrease and the pendeluft volume decreases. 
So the lower the respiratory drive, the lower the pendulum volume, at least in this example. So to conclude this first part, yes, partially supported modes in patients with ARDS seem to be, I'm more careful than here on the slide, seem to be safe in selected patients. But we have to be very careful in patients with a high respiratory drive because this may cause or further enhance lung injury. So then the question is, if we have our patient with this high respiratory drive, how do we manage them? What do we do to control the drive? The first thing is, say this patient is on 12 of pressure support and the tidal volumes are around 10 ml per kilograms. Would it be a great idea to reduce your level of support? Well, actually, that's what we did in this study, just published in the Blue Journal. So at 12 of pressure support, and these were patients with AIDS PF ratio around 140, we decreased the level of support, and indeed tidal volume goes down as expected. But at the same time, the effort by the diaphragm, as shown here by the electrical activity, actually increases. And therefore, the change in transpulmonary pressure is not significantly different. We decrease support by the ventilator, and now the patient is pulling harder. And that might be a problem, because look right here. This shows you the work of breathing. And a normal work of breathing, as we're sitting in this room, would be around 0 0.4, 0 0.5 joule per liter. And these patients already had a high work of breathing, while on 12 of pressure support, 0.8 joule per liter. Now, if you decrease inspiratory support, work of breathing goes up. And if we think about it, that might be, but I'm careful again, that might be a problem to the diaphragm. Because if you have a high respiratory uh, work of breathing for prolonged periods of time, this may result in injury. And there is some indirect evidence. These are data from Kuhn Ottenheim from Amsterdam. He took biopsies of the diaphragm of ventilated patients. These were all patients that had to go to the OR for laparotomy or thoracotomy. And indeed, he found atrophy, as has been described by Levine as well. But if you look at more detail, a lot of other things are going on. There's inflammation, some oxidative stress, other protein modifications, inflammation, which is not consistent with disuse atrophy. This might be, but it's a hypothesis, this might be the result of prolonged periods of too high effort of the diaphragm. Okay, so if we, if we don't want to decrease inspiratory support, if that's perhaps not the best idea, perhaps you can increase the level of sedation. Nice data from the lab of Paolo Navalesi. Increasing, of course, your dose of propofol will, research, will decrease the inspiratory effort and such reduce the tidal volume, which in general may be a good idea, but we all know that high doses of sedatives are associated with adverse effects as well, right? Delirium, impaired mobilization, prolonged ICU stay. So it's a reasonable strategy, but it has adverse effects as well. Third, if the patient has a really high respiratory drive, data shown by Pepper um, go for the full uh, neuromuscular blockade. Completely take the diaphragm out of the loop again. And it improves survival in patients with PF ratio lower than 120, but we don't know for the patients that are later in their disease. Then I'm show, going to show you just one picture of a new strategy which is still very experiment, experimental, that, but that we just published, is instead of providing full dose neuromuscular blockers, we just tried to titrate it a little bit. So we just give a little bit of rocuronium and see in these patients, for instance, go from a tidal volume of 10 ml per kilogram to 6 ml per kilogram. So it's not really decreasing the respiratory drive, but it's decreasing the consequences, the mechanical output associated with the high respiratory drive. And indeed, that reduces tidal volume, it reduces your transpulmonary pressure, so it looks like it results in lung protective ventilation, and it decreases the work of breathing for the diaphragm.
So it sounds like an attractive strategy. I think you have to be careful to use this. I think you shouldn't be using this in your clinical practice now, but I already heard that some people are doing it. I would highly recommend you not to do this. This is an idea. And finally, a good way to modulate your respiratory drive is ECMO. And these are very nice data published in anesthesiology last year from uh, Maori, and he showed right here, this is tidal volume versus the gas flow by ECMO. So this is no gas flow and an increased gas flow. And the higher the gas flow in patients that are on NAVA or on pressure support ventilation, the lower the tidal volume. And also the lower the pressure developed by the inspiratory muscles, the lower the P.1. So it's a very nice way to modulate your respiratory drive, I guess. And this basically shows the same. The more CO2 that's cleared by ECMO, the lower the transpulmonary pressures. Very nice data. So to conclude this part, yes, there are several strategies to modulate your respiratory drive or the motor output of the respiratory drive. We have to consider the risks and benefits for each individual patient, and some of the strategies I've shown you, of course, are just experimental more for the future. But I think an important lesson we start to learn is that we need to monitor the respiratory drive. What is the patient actually doing while he's on the ventilator? And we wrote two review papers on it. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I th really think in ICU patients, and I'm sure the next speaker will address this as well, we need to start monitoring respiratory drive and respiratory muscle function. It's surprising. We assess continuously cardiac function, kidney function, perhaps brain function, but nobody really seems to care about the prolonged respiratory muscle function. We only worry when the patient wakes up weak. So that's an important message, I guess. So to conclude, Mr. Chairman, should we let our patients breathe? Perhaps, yes. It restores normal breathing physiology. It may protect the respiratory muscles from disuse atrophy. And it may even be feasible in patients with ECMO. I haven't gone too far into that. It will be addressed later on. But there is a very important warning. And I think we start to consider to realize this more and more, the early spontaneous breathing. We should be very careful in patients with a high respiratory drive and lung injury. It may actually further enhance lung injury. And I think now that we need additional monitoring techniques and consider all the techniques we can use to modulate the respiratory drive. Thank you very much.